So I'm really glad that everybody could make it. I'm going to go ahead and get started real quickly here. Um, I'm going to start off with showing you how to access Ancestry Library Edition. So everybody should be seeing the library home screen now. So yes, this is our main home page. Everybody should be fairly familiar with that. And oops, go away chat. And then, so to access Ancestry Library Edition, you have to go through our homepage. So you're gonna go to ebrpl.com. You're gonna hit the digital library right here. And then you can either go by subject down to genealogy. And those of us who are in the class, you should have a little cheat sheet that'll tell you this. Uh, I forgot to attach it to our email for our at home viewers. So if you need it, go ahead and let us know at the end and I will email it to you. Um, you can either go by subject or you can go to the A to Z list, whichever you're more comfortable with. And then down here to genealogy. And there it is, it's the third one down. So, come on, I believe in you. It is not wanting to load right now, which sounds about right. But when you see it, you, it will have a page. Hang on, I have to reshare my screen here real quickly. I'm gonna switch us over. At the end, we'll play around with it in person too. But first, okay. So now everybody should be seeing my PowerPoint. This is Ancestry to Library Edition. It still says Cassandra up there when I was using my more formal name. I don't do that anymore. So you could just call me Kay. Um, Ancestry Library Edition. So I really love Ancestry Library Edition because it, first of all, it saves you the money. But secondly, it um, kind of eliminates a lot of the noise that comes with Ancestry. It's very streamlined. Um, so in this class, we're gonna talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using Ancestry, the different types of records that are available through Ancestry learn how to research and refine the results, explore different browsing and sharing options, and then how to download and print records and locate help and support resources, both at Ancestry and here at the library. So it sounds like a lot, but I promise it's not gonna be that bad. We should be done by 345. Ancestry Library Edition. So with Ancestry, there is about, there's actually like three separate steps. So the free one that the, is the one that everybody's familiar with, you get your, your trial and everything. You can create a family tree and view your DNA results. So you can take a DNA test through Ancestry without having to open an Ancestry account. You can create a free account and do that. So you don't have to pay to view your Ancestry DNA results. You can also connect with your matches via just messaging. Um, but that's kind of really all that you can do. You can't use message boards. You can't use any of the social stuff. You can't see the records. You can't attach anything. The library edition kind of falls in the middle. Um, it lets you search the records, download and print them, read the message boards, but not participate. And then view photos, stories, um, trees, et cetera, from other users, but you can't create your own. So if you want to create your own ancestry family tree and save all the records and use the little leaves that you see in all the commercials and everything, then you have to use the paid version, which lets you do everything, obviously. And they limit that for obvious reasons. They want you to pay for it. <laughs> so, no, the library does not have the paid version. We have the library edition. And we're going to talk a little bit about like what the differences are there. But mostly what you need to know about it is uh, the library edition doesn't let you do the social aspects of it. And the free edition doesn't let you do the um, record aspect of it. So it'll let you build the tree, but you can't attach anything. So Ancestry, everybody kind of probably has a pretty good idea of what Ancestry is and what they do. You've seen the commercials online and everything. It doesn't quite work the way the commercials would like you to believe that it does. <laughs> if it did, I wouldn't have a job um, because the commercials like to make it look like you just get in there and type in your name and boom, you have everything you ever wanted. It doesn't quite work that way. It's very easy to use. It's very user friendly, but it can also be overwhelming just because of the sheer volume of records that Ancestry has. It'll also connect you to a large community of family history researchers. As we always say, when you're dealing with other researchers, take anything you come across unless it's written in ink as a grain of salt. Um, not all of those resources are available. Not all resources are available through Ancestry Library Edition. They do have a few um, specialized databases. For instance, I know that like we had somebody who called in looking to access a record, a Mexican death record. 
And we didn't have access to that. That was a, a world traveler record. So you had to have the highest tier of ancestry to be able to access that. So they do hold a few things back because as always, they want you to pay for it. They want you to pay for it, even though we pay for it, they want you to pay for it too. <laughs> it is, it really is. And a lot of what we're gonna be doing in here today, you can use if you have a paid subscription too. So, yeah. So, you know, all of the, the variety of records, the, all that stuff, you can do that with the free or with the paid version too. You cover a lot of ground very quickly. And in some ways this can be a good thing and a bad thing. We're gonna talk about that as well. Um, now that it has to be used in the library to avoid subscription fees, the library edition, except right now, Ancestry has very kindly offered to let us extend it to use from home. So as long as you have a valid library card through the end of September, you can access Ancestry Library Edition from home. So you guys at home who are watching this with us, you can do this right along with us. So the thing that I just took you through on our website, how to get there, if you're accessing it from home, it's gonna pop up with another screen that's gonna say, enter your library card number. If you put your library card in and it, it throws a wall at you, you know, that says this, this card is no longer active or whatever, give us a call. It could be a problem with your card, but it could also be a problem on our IT end. So it happens. Um, it contains facsimiles of many original documents, which is just a fancy word for saying copies. Resources are constantly being added and or removed, but the indexes are not always accurate. And we're gonna talk about that too. Um, basically, what you need to know is while Family Search, which is the other big genealogy database out there, while Family Search has human volunteers who go through and index everything, Ancestry has their own, I can't remember, optimization something technology. It's OST technology that reads the, the records for you and transcribes them. So they won't always get it right. It contains US and UK federal census records from 1790 to 1940. It also contains some of the non-population schedules, things like the Dawes rolls um, for Native American research, um, the, a couple of the agricultural schedules, the mortality schedules. And if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about that, next month we have a new class. Um, I'm teaching it in August called Census Non-Population Schedules. So it talks about you know, how you can use those to kind of supplement your family history and fill in those gaps between the 10-year censuses. Includes vital records like births, marriages, and deaths, including the Social Security Death Index. We're gonna talk a little bit about that too because there's no centralized database for vital records from all states. Um, each state does things a little bit differently. So some things may be on there and other things may not. And then passenger and immigration lists, 16th to mid 20th century also includes things like inbound and outbound manifests, um, slave manifests, cargo manifests, that kind of thing. So if you're doing some research in those areas, it can help with that as well. Indexes to newspapers and periodicals that has an asterisk because they keep saying they're gonna remove that index and then they don't, and then they add things and then they don't. So we, we never really know what's going on with that. Military records, including Civil War, World War I, and World War II. World War II. Why can't I ever say World War II? Um, and the thing with World War II is they have you. Military records have to be sealed for seventy something years before they're accessible to the public. Um, and in 1973, there was a big fire in DC, and most of the records for World War II were lost. So if you had a service member in World War II and you're struggling to find information for him or her, that may be why, um, but there are some ways around that. So if you're interested in learning more about that, we also teach Fold 3, which is Ancestry's military-centric database. That would be a good class for you if you had family who served in the war. Also offers millions of user-generated family trees. As I said, as far as family trees go, anything that you find on a user generated piece of information, be careful with, because anybody can say anything. Some people really don't like having blanks in their family tree, so they'll fill in what they think fits in that hole, whether they know it or not. So they think this person died before 1880 because they can't find them on the census. So they'll put that in there, but then they find out later, oh wait, he just moved and he was you know, farming somewhere else and they don't go back and correct it. Um, federal slave narratives and some Freedmen's Bureau records. If you're looking for Freedmen's Bureau, I highly recommend um, going to Family Search. They have the whole 
of it. And it is, it is quite an impressive collection of records. Something like 4 million different records um, from 1865 to 1872. So those are very formulative years for a family trying to trace their, their ancestors back through that time of slavery and emancipation. Then there are state specific special records collections. We'll go into a couple of those later. Unfortunately, Louisiana has some of the strictest privacy laws in the nation, go figure. So we don't have a whole lot of state specific special records collections here, but lots of our states around us do. Mississippi has quite a few, Texas has quite a few. So you can always kind of see if it crosses the lines and your, your family crosses the lines into other states as well. Ancestry Map Center, which contains more than a thousand historical maps, which sounds really super cool, but it contains historical maps from all over the world. So a thousand can go really far, but usually, unfortunately, you don't find a whole lot that's super useful. And then it has over 1.2 billion different names and 40,000 different databases, and it's still growing. And I just updated those stats earlier this year, so it, it's probably pretty accurate. Things that are not on Ancestry. Sealed records, 50 years for birth records, 100 years for death records, and even that, and that's Louisiana centric. Um, like I said, each state is a little bit different. Some states are 100 years for death records. Some states are 125 years for birth records. Louisiana is on the higher end of it. You also may not find a death record if your ancestor's death had a coroner's inquest surrounding it. Um, some of those don't get released to the public. So if you go to look for a, a record for an ancestor and you can't find it, that may be why. Um, you also will not find current vital records for people still living. If you add somebody to your family tree, like my grandfather, who is 92, mm -hmm. is still living. Um, if I add him to my family tree, he won't show up on anybody else's. It's private as long as people are still living. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just to protect people's privacy for obvious reasons. And the census records more recent than 72 years, again, same reason. Um, we generally tell everybody start after 1940. That's the last census that we have, or start before 1940, go back after 1940. Um, because that's the last census that we have available to us. Yeah, the, um, the, tw uh, the 50 census will open in April of 22. So that's when the 1950 census will be released. It's 72 years. Um, that law went into effect when the average lifespan of, a, of an American citizen was 72 years. Mm -hmm. And so it was locked for what was expected to be the average lifespan of an American citizen. Um, and they've just never gone back and readjusted that. So that's why it's such a weird number. <laughs> um, and that's also why it's so important to begin your research at home before you start tapping into online resources. In the packet that was either emailed to you or is sitting on this table over here, um, it should have at the very back kind of a getting started page. And that's gonna talk about how to approach your family if you're trying to fill in people back to 1940. Um, you generally, we say back to 1940, but like if your ancestor was born in 1940 and you don't know anything about their parents, try to get yourself back a little further than that. Because if you don't know anything about their parents, there's not gonna be very many records before they drop off because 1940 is kind of the cutoff. So if you don't know anything about your grandparents who were born in 1940, you may wanna ask around your family, ask some aunts and uncles or some cousins or mm -hmm. whoever, um, if they know anything about your great grandparents because you need to get back a little further. Begin with realistic goals and expectations to get satisfactory results. We've had people who've come into the genealogy department and sat down and gone, okay, I wanna do my family history. And it's like, okay, but that's really broad. <laughs> so you might need to, to narrow that down for me just a little bit. What is it exactly that you're hoping to find or trying to achieve? Um, organize your research with forms. We're gonna cover these forms. These should also be in that packet that you were given and they should be in this order. So. You should have your pedigree chart first and then your research calendar, the extract, and then the family group sheet. And we're gonna look at examples of each of these and talk about why they're so important. Um, and ancestry.com, and I will switch back over and show this to you in a minute, but I uh, don't wanna mess up my stream right now. So we'll do that at the very end. Um, there's actually a bunch more forms on ancestry. These are the ones that we generally use the most. 
And some of them, as we talk about these, it's going to be obvious that we use certain ones more than we use others, but some of them you probably should use. Don't be like me and not use it and then wish later you had started using it. Okay, so this is a pedigree chart, more commonly now called an ancestral chart. And this is for my great, great, yes, no, my great grandmother, my great grandmother and her husband. So you can see here, you can follow with my pointer. I need to get one of those bright pointers. This is my great grandmother. Her birth record actually says the 10th of May, 1890. But because my grandmother, her daughter is still alive, um, I know that she was actually born in April. The birth record is wrong because my grandmother knew her mother and knew when she celebrated her birthday. So that's one of those things that is why it's so important to talk to people. Um, and then when they were married and when they died and the name of their spouse. And then next to it, fathers go up top, mothers go underneath, always use your women by their maiden names. Um, because if you start using their, your, start inputting your women by their married names, your lines are going to get confused and crossed. <laughs> so yes, um, men go in on top, women go in underneath, always by their maiden names. It is completely okay to not have all the answers. I'm not 100% sure when Grandma Emmy was born and I'm not 100% sure where. I have a good idea, but it's okay to not know. Um, and then we get a lot of people who will be like, well, I know she was born in 1859, but I don't know when. It's okay, that's something that we'll probably come up with research. Mm -hmm. um, and so her father's parents and her mother's parents, so on and so forth back. You can see here, person number one on this chart is the same as person number five on chart number two. So this is our third chart. So when you're looking at the chart that is me and we're going back, this is actually branched off of the chart that is for my grandmother. That's why it's chart three. My grandmother is person one on chart two. So that's why she becomes person five so that's how you can link it back because you can see as the further back we go, the less information there is on each person. So you start a new chart and then you can fill it in with all the information. This serves as kind of a little cheat sheet for you as you're doing your research. If you come across another Emma Height who has a birth year of 1879 and she was born in Idaho, we can tell at a glance that's not our Emma because ours was born in 1859 in Ohio. And like we said, sometimes those things may be a year or two off, maybe up to five years off, but 1879 versus 1859 is a big difference. Um, it might also, and if the record also lists her parents and her parents are not listed as Samuel and Rachel, another good indication we have the wrong person. These are great to keep on hand as you do your research so you can just flip through and go, oh yeah, this is my person or it's not. A research calendar, this is one of the things I was talking about when I used the, um, when I said there are a lot of things that we use and then there are things we don't use as often as we should. This is one of the things I don't use as often as I should. These are wonderful because they keep you from backtracking over yourself. So I started keeping this one. I'm looking for the death of my family, uh, my great times three grand aunt, I think she was. Um, and her name was Hannah Marks. Well, her maiden name was Hannah Bowen. And so I'm trying to find out when she died. And that's important to me because I think that oral history tells me that she actually died in childbirth and there may have been another child. So it's important for me to know where and when she died. So I know if I have another child I need to look for. So I started keeping this one in July of 2019. You can keep it down to the day, but I just find as long as I keep track of the months, it's fine. Um, where I looked for or where I found that resource, this is at Allegheny County Library, which is in um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Picked up, uh, I was looking for a book on cemetery records. The book is titled Tread Softly. It's by Jay Semezki. And the years that I searched and names that I searched. So I was looking in 1878 to 1880 because we think she died in 78. Um, so I went a couple of years ahead just in case the records were off. And the names that I searched, Hannah Bowen and Hannah Marks, nothing. So I did that each time I looked for this particular thing. Um, you can see the last time, <laughs> the last time I updated it was uh, January of 2020. 
Um, but you know, each time I look for something, I keep track. Grace was the name of the daughter that we think she was, she was in labor with when she died. And if Grace was born, I actually have two different death dates for her. One source says, actually, I can show you here. This is my research extract. So this I filled out after my dad, that's why his initials are here, went to the Allegheny County Courthouse and looked at the death ledger there. Um, I have her listed as Bowen here because I'm m women under their maiden name. Um, these files are not indexed. So I know if I wanna go back and look that I have to slate out some more time because they're not in any particular order. So you have to go through them slowly. The names that I searched, the date of death, and then I note here that one source says she died in childbirth, only two recordings of an eighth child who would have been Grace, Grace Marks, date of birth, 14th of January, 1878. One source says Grace died later that day, another lists 1938 as a date of death. So we don't even know if this person existed and if she did, when she died. So that's, that's the objective of this search, keeping track of the microfilm number and all that. So if I go back to the Allegheny County Courthouse, I had the number of the microfilm that I searched and I know what I was looking for and when I was there to find it. The other thing we have here is a family group sheet. Um, some of you may have seen a family group sheet if you've done genealogy for a while. Again, this kind of just like the pedigree chart serves as a cheat sheet for you. Uh, father goes up top, mother goes underneath, Hannah Bowen her parents' names, his parents' names, and years of, of life. So he was born in 14 and died in 1870. Where they were born, when they were born, when they died, so on and so forth. And then under here, we have all, all of the children listed. So William James Jr. was their first son, and then Alan, Daniel, Enoch, Clifford, James, and then their daughter, Sophia. And then supposedly Grace. So I added Grace to this so that I could keep track if I ever come across her. Mm -hmm. The X in this column denotes which person is my direct ancestor. So like I said, Grace and, and uh, Hannah are my like off, Grace would have been my great, great aunt, something like that. And then over here, you keep track of their date of marriage and the name of their spouses. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little more important to get that right for the women than the men, because again, if you want to keep tracing those women later on, you need to know what their married name was. Sophia became Sophia Foley instead of Sophia Marx. Mm -hmm. um, and then the dates of death and where, because again, it's important to know where and when they died so you know where to keep looking. Could it be possible that after her mother died, Grace went to live with one of her older siblings, you know, because William at that point would have been 18, what? would have been 18 or so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe he took the baby with him. We don't know. Searching Ancestry Library Edition. So now you have an idea of your, your um, forms and your files. You know where to look, you know how to get there, where you go from here. So these are the three kinds of search we're gonna quickly, searches we're gonna quickly look at here. Our basic, our advanced, and then the card catalog. A basic search is exactly what it sounds like. So here I'm gonna switch over very quickly. Uh, people in the chat, let me know if, it's, if your screen does not change yet. Come on, there we go. Okay, so once you get in and you put in your in, um, information and everything, here in the library, you can just type in ancestrylibrary.com and it'll take you to it. At home, you'll have to go through the steps I just showed you of going to the homepage and then going to the digital library and so on. Here, you can kind of get around it. So you go here, basic search, you just literally just click search and go to all categories. And it's going to take it a second to load. And here's your basic search. So it's asking for first and middle names, last name, place your ancestor might have lived, and then the year of their birth. That's the only place you need to know, only thing you need to know. So if you only know their first and last name and a good idea of when they were born and where, you can go from there. So I'm going to put in Emma Height, as we talked about, 1859. Um, and here you can, you can extend your time. So if you want to search exactly for that year, you can. I very, very rarely use that feature um, because so many records are off by a year or two at that point in time. There were no birth records. People didn't keep track of stuff. So there very well may be several records out there that say she was born in 1860 or 1861. So I usually go at least two years in either direction. 
and we know she was born in Ohio. So we just put that in and boom. Again, one of the first thing that's usually gonna come up is an ancestry tree. Um, this all actually looks correct. Um, but again, I only know that because I know her. So if this is your first time doing these searches, it's a good idea to take this for re reference purposes, but don't take it as gospel truth. Um, oh, okay. And down here, you're gonna get a couple of other, you're gonna get your, your census records and everything. Um, you're gonna get your obituary index, which tells you where her obituary was printed and when. Um, a couple of different censuses, so on and so forth. So it's a good place to start your search. Hang on, I'm gonna switch you back. Share screen. Sure. Okay. An advanced search is exactly the same thing. You're just gonna click underneath there, um, right here where it says show fewer options. On the basic search, it's gonna have one that says show more options. Click that and you'll get all of this stuff. And you can add in all different th kinds of things. So here we can see 1879 is the year that she got married. She was 20. And we know that she got married in Sandusky County, Ohio. We know that her spouse's name was John W. Boland, John Wesley Boland. So as you fill in those blanks, you can be more and more specific, and then you're going to narrow down your search results. Because, hang on a second, switching you all back over. Because when you put in a name that's more common, like let's say her last name was Smith, and if we didn't know for sure that she was born anywhere but the state of Ohio, you type that in, now we've got 56,000 different results. So you can see that it's kind of important to be able to narrow things down to get a better idea of who we're looking at. So as you fill in that information and you have, oh, go away, Paul, and you have more to go off of, you can easily narrow down those search results so that you get, you go from 56,000 to 10,000 to 3,000 to, you know, 900. And now you're getting more and more specialized. So advanced search does that. Uh, it adds extra criteria to narrow your search results. Advanced search allows you to add life event dates, names of family members, gender, race, and nationality. So again, um, you can narrow down your results if you're looking in a place where you know the, the area is predominantly white and you want to narrow it down to only the black uh, family's results. You can do that, vice versa. Um, you can use exact search to further narrow your results. Once again, very rarely do I use exact search um, because so often you'll accidentally exclude somebody misspelling your name, somebody getting your birth date wrong, something like that. No, oh, come on, I believe in you. There we go, card catalog search. Card catalog searches can be kind of frustrating because Ancestry, this is like the one area that they tend to want to be really exact. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for a particular database, like here, I was looking for, I know Pennsylvania death certificates are in here, but when I went and typed it into the title bar, it wouldn't give me the results because I didn't use the comma correctly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it can be very, or I didn't know, what I did was I put in Pennsylvania death certificates and it, I forgot to put in the US, even though we know it's the US because Pennsylvania is in the United States. Um, I forgot to put that in, so it wouldn't give me my results. It can be very finicky, so you might have to play with it a little bit. Card catalog, hold up, I'm going to swap you all over again. Y'all are going to get sick of these, these screens changing. Okay, so your card catalog search under search, it's the very last result. And it's going to give you sorted by date added. So it's going to give you the newest things that have been added to the catalog first. You can go by um, record count. That's how you get your bigger things, like your uh, public member trees here has 1.8 billion results. Um, city directories has 1.5 billion results because it covers the years 1822 to 1995. So you're talking about a huge span of time and then every city directory that Ancestry has access to. Obituary index, yearbooks, so on and so forth. So it's gonna go down um, to the more specialized ones at the bottom. You can also sort it alphabetically, or you can sort it by the last time it was updated. So the more recently updated ones will come to the top too. Mm -hmm. 
just depends on which way you prefer to look. One second. All right. So now that we have a little bit more of an idea of exactly what we're looking for and where, we can refine our results. So you narrow your results using all categories. The all categories panel is located on the left side of the search results screen. Various record types are listed here, including user-generated family trees. Click a link to narrow search results down to that specific type of record. So I'm gonna show you real quickly. So here, we're gonna go back to good old Emma Smith here. and say we didn't know exactly when she was born, but we think it was sometime in the 1860s. So go 1865 plus or minus five years and in Ohio. And like I said, now we have 137,000 results and you really don't wanna to have to sit here and pick through 137,000 separate results. So over here on the left, we have our filter by all categories. We have census and voter lists, birth and marriage and death records, immigration and naturalization records, so on and so forth. So if we're looking for family trees, you can narrow it that way. If we know we only wanna look in North America, we can narrow it that way. That's gonna eliminate 30,000 plus results right there. See, now we went to 96,000. So we know Emma was born in Ohio and lived her whole life there. So we can exclude um, international records. Now we're going to go ahead and exclude birth, marriage, and death records and all the rest of this by going to census and voter lists. Now we can see if we can look for her on the very first census we suspected she would have turned up on, which would have been the 1870 census because she was born sometime in the 60s. And now we've gone from 137,000 results down to 10,900 just by trying to search for that one particular piece of information. And then we can kind of just start narrowing it down even further by going through some of these results. So that is super helpful. One of the other things you can do, I'm gonna change things very quickly, is expanding by the suggested results. So here I'm going to pull up my Emma because I wanna show you a, an exact record that I'm looking for. So see, as you get more and more familiar with your records and your people that you're researching, you can be more and more specific. And now I only have 385 results. So here is my Emma. And I know that because these are her parents and they're the right age. They're living in the right place. She's the right age. She'd have been about 11 here. Oops, I didn't want to click on that. Sorry, everybody. I wanted to click on this. It's gonna give you um, what we call a transcription page, which is basically just taking all the information on this like really, really hard to read census and writing it down here. So we have Emma, Ellen, Chester, and Charles. They were super creative with names. But right here are our suggested records. So these are not always going to be accurate, but what Ancestry tries to do is calculate the probability that the person they're suggesting to you is the person that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I know this is right here. This is her find a grave index because I know that she married John Wesley Bolin. She became Emma D. Bolin and that's who she was. Mm -hmm. So these suggested records can be very helpful, but they can be not so helpful too if you get off and you pick up the wrong Emma height. So they're very useful, but again, always be suspicious of what you're getting on the records. And then you can refine your search criteria. Oh, here, forgot, I have to switch you back. Sorry, everybody. Where'd you go? There you go. Share. Okay, then you can refine your search criteria as we showed you in just a minute ago, editing, edit your search link in the search filter panel and narrowing it down to only the Northern, uh, or I'm sorry, only North America, and then narrowing it down to only census records, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that really helps when you're faced with 175,000 different results mm -hmm. to get you down. So we talked about using search filters, narrow down or broaden your search results by using the filters in the top left corner of your initial search results screen. Filters allow you to range between broad and exact results and first and last names, birth year and location. 
then it also will, so a wildcard multiple letter search can be very helpful. Here's some examples of what I'm talking about. If you're not sure how somebody would have spelled your great great grandmother's first name, um, if you search for R O S and then you asterisk the end of it, it's going to search for up to five different characters following that R O S. So you might get Rosa, Roseanne, Rosalia, so on and so forth. Same thing with R O B star S O N. It's going to fill in that with up to five, that star area with up to five letters. And it'll give you Roberson, Robinson, Robertson, so on and so forth. If you're only not sure about one letter, like you're not sure if your ancestor spelled their last name as Francis with an E or an I, you can do the exact same thing with just a question mark instead of the asterisk. And it's only gonna search for one letter in there. So that way you'll only get results for Francis with the E, the I, or however else somebody might've spelled it. So there are lots and lots and lots of ways for somebody to misspell a name. Um, a lot of times it's bad handwriting. It's phonetic. It's the fact that the census taker did not speak whatever language he's censusing mm -hmm. <laughs> of the family that he's he's enumerating. So you get you know phonetic misspellings, um, zataran to zatin, uh, transliterations where people will drop a letter or add a letter or swap a couple of letters around. Mm -hmm. Translations. Um, a lot of times census takers did not know how to spell a specific word, so they would just swap it out for whatever its English meaning might be. Mispronunciation, like I said, um, anything with a B, a P, a D, a T, an F, a P, you know, like as you're saying it out loud, you have to get people to spell things for you. If they just didn't get them the pronunciation proper properly, you might have that quite often. Things like barefoot to barefoot. Mm -hmm. um, again, accents, variations in regional dialects, um, especially places like here where a lot of people spoke Cajun French or Creole. French, um, you know, their, their actual pronunciation of their name might not have been what the census taker heard. And sometimes they were careful to try and sometimes they weren't. Abbreviation or expansion, Davies to Davis, Russell to Russell, so on and so forth. Somebody might spell, especially with, again, with a French name like we have around here, they may add or drop the X. It could be a million different things. Substitution, sometimes you just, sometimes they just get it completely wrong. You'll see all kinds of things. And you can generally know, even if a name is somewhat off or a name is wrong, especially for people who might have gone by a middle name or a woman who might have given a maiden name, even though she was married. I've seen that happen, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know you know it's the right person generally by the rest of the people living in the house. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if, if it's the right husband's name and the right children in the right birth order with the right ages, even though the name may be misspelled, you have a pretty good indication that you got the right person because what are the odds that they'd have seven children all named the exact same thing who were born at the same time as another person's. So browsing, we talked a little bit about this. This is just your, your card catalog. You can see here we sorted by popularity, which I think they've actually since dropped since I got this screenshot. Um, I don't think it's by popularity anymore. Now it's by record count, but same general idea. Viewing originals. So once you find something like this, as I showed you here, new share. We're gonna go back to our 1870 census very quickly here. So here's our transcription page. Here is our actual page from the census. So you can see here that the trans or the handwriting rather is not great. So you can get the actual copy of it. You might wanna get your transcription page as well. But once you do that, you can, as you see here, I'm zooming in and out using the wheel on my mouse. You can also use your plus and minus here. Your little toolbox here will let you download, um, print, rotate, flip, invert the colors in case it makes it really hard to read, which this makes it way worse so on and so forth. So there's some of you, we call that your little toolbox there, the little things that you can do with the record once you find it. And hold on, we're gonna swap you, swap you back over home viewers. There we go. We're gonna go on to our next one. Once we find the image, as I showed you, this is what our toolbox looks like. 
You can either print it straight from the computer. You can't save anything on the library computers. All of our computers here at EBR are virtual machines, which means when you leave it and you close it down, it's wiped. So anything that you save, you need to make sure you save to your own flash drive or print it out or email it to yourself, any of those things, because once it's gone, it's gone. We can't get it back for you. Um, you can alter the appearance of documents for easier viewing by inverting the colors or rotating the image. Sometimes, especially with those longer pages, they'll go into Ancestry on their sides so you can rotate it so it's easier to read. Click the show index button at the bottom of the screen to display a TypeScript list of names on the page. So I'll show you super quickly what that means right here. So here is our index and it's gonna show you, there's Emma, there's Ellen, Chester and Charles. And then you can scroll up to see the parents, scroll down to see the other people listed on that page. And it's gonna give them by surname, given name, age, year of birth, gender, race, so on and so forth. So if you're having trouble reading these terrible handwriting, that can sometimes help, but be aware that if it's super faded, super scratched, the handwriting is really awful, your transcription might not be right either because we're relying on the computer to properly transcribe it. Usually it's pretty good, not always. All right. Browsing the path bar. So we're going to use the bar located at the top of the document window to navigate inside of a collection. For example, if you are viewing a city directory, you can click on the city or the year to access a drop down list and switch quickly to other cities or years. So here, the, it looks exactly the same on the page. I'm going to spare our home viewers from flipping the screen back and forth too much, but this is it's literally copied right off the screen. So you can click on Louisiana and it'll give you a list of states that have that option. It, you can click on the city of Baton Rouge. It'll give you different cities within Louisiana, years within there, and then it'll give you different options. So sometimes this one, for instance, Baton Rouge actually has two city directories for several years, mm -hmm. the city proper and then the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So it'll give you two different options. It'll either say Baton Rouge, Louisiana city directory, mm -hmm. or it'll say Baton Rouge, Louisiana city limits, and then it'll say Baton Rouge, Louisiana suburbs. Mm -hmm. So it'll give you different options for it. If you know your family's from Zachary, you're gonna wanna look in the suburbs. Clicking the tool icon to bring up the print feature, you have two print options. You can either print the entire image or print the zoomed view. Um, if you print the zoomed view, just be careful because it doesn't give you any of the other information on the page, just what's in your zoomed view. So we'll have people who will do that because it's easier to read, but then they can't remember exactly what the record was that they printed because they've cut off everything around the outside of the page. For instance, the part that tells you which census it's from or where it was taken. You can change the page layout from portrait to landscape in the print options window that appears after you cl click the button. And that's pretty much exactly what it looks like once again. Um, also get print index and source data. That's what you wanna do if you're gonna print a zoomed in view because that way it'll still tell you this is from the 1860 census, it's from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so on and so forth. So that when you need to go back and find the full record again, you can. Discovery pages, um, discovery pages they've actually kind of sort of done away with. It doesn't quite look the same anymore, but it's basically the allowable feature to email a record to yourself. Mm -hmm. So you can email things to yourself so that you can print them out later. Okay. Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't really give you a defined uh, subject line. It's gonna just automatically generate it for you. So when you're looking at your email inbox, you're gonna have 15 things from Ancestry and just at a glance, you're not gonna be able to tell what any of them are. <laughs> I've learned this the hard way. <laughs> so if you're gonna email something to yourself, it's generally easier to download the document and attach it to an email. And then you can write in the body of your email or in the subject line, what that document is. So you don't have 15 things from Ancestry that you can't tell what anything is. Help resources. This is a really nice little feature. I'm gonna switch us over here and show this to you because this is actually an outdated screenshot because I'm lazy and didn't feel like updating it. So going back to ancestrylibrary.com, we're gonna back out of this. We're gonna go all the way home. Here's our learning center. And you can see this is actually, it looks the same. It hasn't changed a whole lot, but there are different, here's your maps that we were talking about, different 
and research aids, these are so cool because they're, they're basically mini classes, kind of like what we're doing right here, getting started, telling you about the censuses and the tips, questions, um, where to go from here, immigration, military, and then different communities within the United States and its history. So if your ancestors were African-American or Swedish, German, Canadian, um, Canadian can be very helpful here, of course, because we know the original Arcadians Acadians came from, usually from Nova Scotia. Um, so that can help you a lot. There's different ones, um, Native American research. We get a lot of people who have some Native American in their family and wanna do some research on that. So that can be very helpful. Come here, let me share my screen. Almost done everybody. We actually ran over a little bit cause I got excited. So how to contact us, I showed you uh, where you can go on the website to access these things. I've got one more thing to show you before I let everybody go today, but this is all of us. Um, the genealogy librarian, my boss, David La uh, Lotch, he is usually here. He's off this weekend. He's usually here most days. So he's a great person to talk to. Obviously, my name is Kay. You can always email us at genealogy at ebrpl.com. Um, and that goes to all of us. So if I'm not in that day, but you have a question, it'll go to all everybody in the genealogy department and somebody will be available to answer your question. Mm -hmm. We are located right here at the other end of the building at the front um, under the sign that says special collections. We're here as long as the library is open, except for the last 15 minutes before closing. So today we close, our department closes at 545 mm -hmm. because we have to shut the archives down. So it takes a little more time. However, one last thing I wanna show everybody before I let everyone go. I'm gonna take you back here. We're gonna to go to our website. Um, so a lot of you probably already know about this, but this is our um, info guide for genealogy. We update it as often as I can. But the more, the more important thing we have in this collection is our classes tab. So this week we had our 60th anniversary diocese talk. Here's our class that we're taking right now. You can register in person or online from this page. There's the non-population schedule class I was just talking about. It's brand new. It launches next, not next week, two weeks. Yep, on the 10th. Um, so this will tell you all the classes that are coming up for the next month or so. And as you can see, like this one is August 10th. So it actually went up several like a week ago, it actually went up and we have a couple of people signed up already. So a lot of times if you wait until the source comes out to see what those classes are, because we can only have five people in a class right now, it may be full before the source even comes out. So this is really helpful for you. Also, the classes as we do them, they're being recorded. So they go up on our classes on demand tab. So these are, this is actually from May. I haven't gotten June's up yet because we're waiting on them to be um, uploaded, mm -hmm. but this is the class from the DNA class from May. This is our maps and land records class, and you can actually just watch the old classes. So it can be really helpful if you miss a class, if there's one you can't take, or there's one we haven't taught in a while mm -hmm. that you can fill in. And then over here on the right are all of the notes and guides for each class. So here, right here, go away is uh, introduction to ancestry library edition. It'll give you a little description and you can click on it and it'll give you the actual lecture that I'm giving you right now. So all of our notes are on here. The last time this was updated was in April, but we try to update them several times a year. There you go. I think that pretty much covers everything. Is anything, anybody have any questions? Anybody in my chat or anybody in person? Some of the, I was trying to do a tree mm -hmm. and not It might be, yeah, trying to view certain trees. It might be that the person who is uh, who created that tree has it locked for privacy reasons. Um, usually it'll say something like, you know, this person has requested that we keep their tree private, but if you ask them nicely, they might share it with you or whatever, and it'll give you a link to email that person. So if it's something that... Oh, that sounds like an ancestry thing going on. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Chrome is being really weird on these computers, which is why I had Explorer open when y'all came in, because Chrome is acting really weird on these computers. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. But if you want to, when we wrap up in here, we'll go down. Yep. 
we'll go down and, and set you up at one of our good computers. Absolutely. Oh, yes, and that's a very excellent point. Somebody in our chat says, whenever possible, view the original records yourself and not just the transcription. That's a very good point because like we said, the transcription can often be very wrong, especially on Ancestry because it relies on uh, the computer to index things. So if the computer reads that transcription wrong, that's what's gonna be on the transcription. Um, so it's always, she's, she's absolutely right. It's always very important if you can to view the original and see if what you're seeing on the original matches up with the transcription. All right, thank you very much, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and close it out unless anyone has any other questions. Otherwise, uh, I hope to see you guys. I'm actually teaching the new class on the 10th. Um, that's my class. So I hope to see everybody there. If you have any questions, you can call us. Our number is here at the bottom. So you can give us a call. Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and close us out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll talk to y'all soon. Bye.